bad at him. At the MGM Grand Hotel in Las Vegas to honor a great entertainer and a great Catholic. <laughs> As a Catholic, Danny is often compared to St. Paul, one of the dullest towns in America. <laughs> Everybody knows Danny is a very religious man, but very few people know he has performed miracles. Later on tonight, he's gonna to prove it. He's gonna bring Don Knotts back to life. <laughs> Danny Thomas has been in show business as far back as I can remember. And Danny, you haven't aged a bit. But there's one thing I have to ask you. Is that a nose or a smog device you got there? <laughs> You should have seen his nose before he had it fixed. <laughs> his old nose can still be seen on television. It's the little house on the prairie. <laughs> when he was a school kid in Michigan, he wasn't much of a student, but he was voted the class humorist. It was between him and Gerald Ford. <laughs> And I didn't know this until the other night. During World War II, <laughs> two, yeah, two. during World War II, Danny had a harrowing experience. An Italian family had him in the cellar for two years. He was living in Detroit at the time. <laughs> After appearing in some amateur shows, Danny decided to leave Detroit and stick his nose into Hollywood. He could have done that without leaving Detroit. <laughs> Danny's got a great show. And before I introduce my first guest, I just want to say, Danny is a very active church member. I'm not saying he wears a halo, but... In his church's Christmas pageant, Danny's going to play one of Charlie's Angels. <laughs> uh, recently, news programs have been using sign languages for the hard of hearing and lip readers. Here's a little Latin lady with a special message for the people who read hips. The Coochie Coochie Girl. Ciao! You know something, I was, I was watching you, and you and I have, we are very much alike underneath. Under what? Underneath. You got it? Well, we are. <laughs> well, I noticed I, that. Well, I mean under the skin, S-K-I-N. No, S-K-I-N, on the skin. Uh -huh. Because we are both hot bladder Latins. <laughs> The first time I saw Danny Thomas, he bumped into me in the street. The second time I saw Danny Thomas, he bumped into me in an hotel lobby. Then he bumped into me at NBC. He never wanted to meet me, just bump. <laughs> I'll be very happy. A long time ago, I used to have accent, but no anymore. <laughs> what the hell's the matter with you? I speak very good English. You come from Machachuche or something like that? Love and Gucci Gucci. So here he is. Red butt. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here tonight, ladies and gentlemen, for Danny Thomas, a legend in his own mind. Some years ago, read in the papers that it takes $10 a week to support a kid in India. So he sent them his kids. <laughs> a man who 
has talent that he's never used at any time. A man who was recently inducted into Hollywood Wax Museum, as is. So why are we throwing this man a dinner? Why are we throwing Danny Thomas a dinner? You want to throw somebody a dinner? Throw it to Don Knotts. He can use the calories. <laughs> Some of the greatest people in the history of the world never got a dinner. Never got a dinner. Never got a dinner. Never. Moshe Diane. Moshe Diane, who once said to Sammy Davis, to me, you only look half Jewish. Robin Hood. Robin Hood. Yes, Robin Hood, who said to Friar Tuck, take those sequins off your robe, we're merry, not gay. The janitor of the, land of the Sistine Chapel, who said to Michelangelo, at least use a drop cloth. The Boston Strangler. Said, ring around the collar, ring around the collar, never got a dinner. <laughs> Mouthy tongue, Mouthy tongue, yes, who died happy knowing that Dean and Jerry made up. <laughs> Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter, who said when the sound went off. <laughs> and those words are as true today as they were when he didn't speak them. couldn't be here tonight, so they sent some wires. <laughs> so it's spelled wires, right? Huh? Well, there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> oh, congratulations to the man who taught me all I know about humility, signed Muhammad Ali. <laughs> Dear Danny, thanks for doing such a good job with our material, signed your original writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. <laughs> I've seen, I've seen Harvey Corman play a hundred different characters on the Carol Burnett Show, and they're all great. Harvey's with us tonight, doing one of his best characters. Ladies and gentlemen, Harvey Corman as Harvey Corman. <laughs> what a night. <laughs> I mean, this is really thrilling for me, and especially to see my idol here. You really are one of my idols. I mean, this man is fantastic. You know that he always, always has gold diggers around him. Always. I mean, they're always around him. He took a shower last night and never got wet. <laughs> I'm really glad to be here tonight. I actually am a very close friend of Danny's. He can tell you he calls me Farfel. And I received... <laughs> he does, Farfel, right? I received a special invitation from Danny. Now, Danny's invitations are very tricky. In order to read them, you have to hold them up to a stained glass window. <laughs> Anyway, I've known Danny for years, really good friends, ever, ever since the day we used to be equals. Remember, Danny? <laughs> you know, even though, even though Danny and I are really good friends, we don't see each other very much. He lives in Beverly Hills, and I live at the beach. And uh, Danny never comes down my way. He gets very upset down. He doesn't like the oil spills. So he keeps slipping every time he tries to walk on the water, so he keeps it away from <laughs> 
Anyway, I was very happy to come here uh, to Las Vegas for Danny. He said I was going to be his personal guest. He arranged a nice room for me, and he did. I thank you for that, Danny. He showed me to the room himself personally, autographed the Bible for me. <laughs> uh, as I said, we are very close, and we have adjoining rooms in the hotel, as a matter of fact. And I never realized, Danny, I hope you don't mind if I share this, that he does use quite a bit of dye up here. You know. And his, uh, his washroom wasn't working very well, so he came across to my room to wash his hair. And my sink looked 10 years younger. <laughs> Our careers have been similar also. I've played many, many different characters on the same show, and he's played the same character on many different shows. <laughs> Of course, uh, I'd just like to say that I really do love Danny. Uh, I've only been kidding about him. And uh, we're very good friends. We've... Oh, sorry. We've known each other for, for many years. And I must tell you in all sincerity that Danny is a great comedian, a fantastic actor, a generous philanthropist, a wonderful human being. But enough of that. I, I don't want to ruin his speech, so I'll just... <laughs> Among real physicians, the practice is second only in popularity to malpractice. <laughs> Here tonight, speaking in defense of AMA, American Medics Anonymous, is the eminent Viennese neurosurgeon, Dr. Charlton Callis. I've been listening to all of this, and all I want to say right now is you're all uh, sick. <laughs> I stand here tonight, ladies and uh, gentlemen, between the uh, hangover and the overhang. Sir, sir, uh, certainly. Uh -huh. The audience, somebody, anybody, to judge this man. What legitimate doctor uses m m meat tenderizer before he operates? <laughs> Say Hong Kong. Hong Kong. <laughs> Jack, a donkey wears a mask in the operating room is so his patients can't identify him later. <laughs> the sign on Dr. Bedford's door says two to four. Those are the odds about getting well. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> Mr. Charlie Callis. There he is, just the best, Mr. Nipsey Ruff. Lebanon is the land of the purebred stallion. It's the land of dreams and promise, of the humble goat and the proud jackass. And that's where we got Danny Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> now, let's not mention disparage. Because Danny is a man, a very public-spirited citizen, and is valuable to any community. When the ladies of the evening proliferated on the streets of Los Angeles to such shocking numbers, Danny was the first to say, I will drive the prostitutes out of this town. When I saw him, he had two of them in the car, and they were headed out. <laughs> no, he's a model husband. Danny really is a model husband. His wife said he was a model husband. And I didn't quite understand until I looked it up in a dictionary. A model is a small representation of the real thing. <laughs> <laughs> but I did think it was nice to know 
what the man's thinking is on many other things. Well, we got to talking about politics. I said, how do you feel about it? He said, I want a man in the White House who prays. At least half of the time we'll know where both his hands are. <laughs> Danny has a marvelous home. He invited me there. It's a sort of a split-level cathedral. I was so, I, so anxious to get there, I ran through two red lights, and that was just in your driveway, Danny. <laughs> Finally, he was showing me around, I looked up, and I said, good Lord, what a beautiful mansion. And a voice said to me, thank you, my son. <laughs> so I say, on with your philosophy, Danny. We know you are heaven-sent. One day we'll carve your words in stone or bury you in cement. <laughs> this lovely lady, and she is lovely when you see her, Miss Dina Dietrich. Ladies and gentlemen. Before I go on, there is one thing I have to know. It's just been driving me crazy. Excuse me, just a minute. Charo, is all that stuff in that dress you? <laughs> uh, remember one thing. It's not nice to fool Mother Nature. <laughs> Since I play the nurse on the practice, I probably know more about Danny Thomas than anyone else. It is very easy dealing with Danny. You come to the studio in the morning, Neil kisses ring, and you're set for the day. <laughs> when Danny wants something from you, he coos like a dove. When he's angry, he screams like an eagle. There are many times I've wanted to kill two birds with one stone. <laughs> Danny tries to make the show as medically authentic as possible. On the set, he has a skeleton hanging. Now, this is not one that he has rented. Actually, it's an actor who died for malnutrition waiting to be paid. <laughs> Danny, you have been a star in nightclubs for 50 years. You've been a star in television for 25 years. You've been a producer for 20 years, and all I can say is, enough is enough already. <laughs> a real funny guy and my buddy, Mr. Jim Murray. Yeah. Yeah. Because Danny is a religious man, pious, devout, deeply spiritual, I have chosen to read a few passages from the Bible this evening. <laughs> you have it right here. A Bible incidentally taken from Danny's own house. One of the 200 I found there. <laughs> if you're ready, I'd like to read a few passages while Danny walks across the ceiling. <laughs> In the beginning, there was earth and sky. Then came thunder and lightning over the little city of Toledo, Ohio. And down below in the home of a poor but honest Lebanese rug peddler, the miracle of birth was taking place. And such a miracle it was. In one precious moment, the mother screameth, the midwife tuggeth, and out into ye world cometh a seven pound, 12 ounce nose. <laughs> the almighty Lord was so impressed, he gathered his angels together and he said, praying like that from one so young shall not go unrewarded. Therefore, from this day on, the place of that infant's birth shall forevermore be known as Holy Toledo. <laughs> Young Amos fell on his knees and he said, Who speaketh? Is it the Lord? And the mighty voice thundered back, Nay, this is William of Morris of the mighty theatrical agency. <laughs> and the voice thundered, Take heed, young Amos, to guide thee on thy path to become a great star, I have here five commandments. Thy must follow forevermore. And young Amos in a hushed voice said, But master, 
I thought there were Ten Commandments. And William of Morris said, yes, there are, but we already took our commission off the top. <laughs> and one cold, rainy night in a city called Detroit, Danny stopped at a little church called Our Lady of Motown. <laughs> he went us to the altar and he prayeth to St. Jude, the patron saint of hopeless causes. Help me, St. Jude, I've tried everything and yet I'm a failure. Help guide me to become a big star and I promise I'll build you a magnificent hospital. And St. Jude said, why? I haven't been sick in 1,500 years. <laughs> Then he left the church, downhearted, crestfallen, but then like a miracle, his star began to rise, the 5100 Club, the Shapery in Chicago, La Martinique, the Copacabana in New York. And again, St. Jude spoke to Danny of Thomas. He said, go ye west across the desert where ye shall find the promised land. And Danny started his sojourn. While crossing the desert, there was a mighty sandstorm. Lashing winds, gusting sand, Danny of Thomas was lost. He looked heavenward and cried aloud, Almighty oh, Lord, am I to die in the sands? And the voice answered, yea, in the sands and the desert in. <laughs> After weeks of thirst and hunger, Danny entered into the promised land, Las Vegas. The first person he met was the bad Samaritan, Dean of Martin. <laughs> so Danny of Thomas, from a humble tenement in Toledo, kept his promise to St. Jude, and he built a shrine for himself in Beverly Hills. <laughs> My good friend, yeah. Mr. Don yeah. Knotts. Yeah. Yeah. Come, come in <laughs> well, I'll tell you something, it's easy to knock Danny Thomas, you know, make jokes about his TV show, his family, his bad movies. But there's one side of Danny that you have not really taken seriously here, his most important quality. You've gone around about it indirectly but not one of you has had the courage to come right out and talk about it and say it directly. And that's his close relationship, and I'm not afraid to say it, his close relationship to G.O.D. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, snicker. <laughs> I used to be a Downing Thomas myself, but today I am a believer. And you know, Dean, Danny was my boss on the Andy Griffith Show. And I'll never forget when I first went in his office what a warm feeling there was. I looked at his secretary and she was a real angel. A real angel. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll tell you something, when that show was canceled, he put his arm around me, he gave me a new direction to the unemployment office. <laughs> but I'll tell you something, Danny never let me down. He knew I needed a job, so he got me one going door to door selling holy water from his swimming pool. <laughs> I tried to solve my problems different ways. I tried Oral Roberts, Bishop Sheen, Billy Graham, Charo. <laughs> what I really needed was a miracle, someone to believe in. And one day I was playing golf with Danny Thomas. He was putting and the hole came to the ball. <laughs> God bless you, Danny. <laughs> Mr. Orson Well. What is funny about Danny Thomas? <laughs> There was a prime minister in England whose name was Gladstone. And uh, it might be said of him that he was two profiles in search of a face. There was so much nose, I'm sorry to use that word. There was, there was so much nose to him that uh, if you turned him sideways, he looked as though he were playing a saxophone. 
hostess had invited him to tea, and she had a little girl who was going to join the, the famous Prime Minister of England and be allowed to sit, and the hostess was terribly worried that the little girl would say something about this monumental edifice in the center of Mr. Gladstone's face. She said, never mention it. Don't ask him why it's so big, and don't ask him if he was born with it. Don't say that word. And so Mr. Gladstone came in and was presented to the little girl, and uh, the hostess sat down, put her hand on the teapot, poured the cup of tea, and then said, Mr. Gladstone, will you have uh, uh, sugar or lemon with your nose? <laughs> Now, I thought of that story because it's, it's my ambition to make a short speech about Danny Thomas without mentioning that proboscis. <laughs> he is, I think, a remarkable actor in the practice, and we know what a benefactor he has been to everyone, and I want him to know that every word I've said comes from the bottom of my nose. <laughs> now I'd like to introduce something fluffy and delicious, a beautiful, gorgeous, fascinating star. Here she is, cotton candy on legs. Miss Lucille Ball. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was a very flattering introduction, Dean. It's amazing how your drinking can go to my head. <laughs> I'm very happy to be here to honor Danny. But you know, actually, I'm surprised because, uh, well, I'll tell you. Recently, I did a guest shot on Danny's show, The Practice. And, uh, well, uh, I wasn't happy with my part. What happened? You and Danny have words, Lucy? Trouble was, I didn't have enough words. <laughs> Wait a minute, Lucy. Sure, sure. I, I had most of the dialogue, but after all, I'm, I play a doctor. Yeah, well, you could have played a surgeon the way you cut out my part. <laughs> I felt like a bowl of alphabet soup with all the letters removed. <laughs> Lucy, I've known you all my life. Yeah. I mean, I, I cut myself in half for you. Oh, no, no. The world is not ready for two Danny Thomases. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, Danny, did Mel Brooks write my part? Well, why do you ask? Because I thought I was doing a silent movie. <laughs> Great to show business. Charlie Chaplin never said a word. Well, he must have said something. He had eight kids. <laughs> You're making a federal case out of the whole thing. Dean, what would you do if you were in my shoes? I'd fall down even more than I do now. <laughs> Dialogue is and everything. Mm. A good actress doesn't need words. Mm. Words aren't important. Mm -hmm. You know what the Chinese say. Yeah, with three, you get egg rolls. <laughs> they say one picture is worth a thousand words. Only in Playboy. <laughs> I'm glad I'm here to add to the accolades that you've received this evening and simply say that I know you're philanthropic, you're a compassionate man, you're a credit to the human race, a great talent, and you're a very nice fellow. Well, that's very sweet, Lucy, but you didn't have to say all that. All, all you could have said was, just a nice fellow. <laughs> you see that? He's cutting my part again. <laughs> Thank you. You'd have to travel pretty far to find a better comic than Mr. Milton Berle, I'll tell you that. 
But it's, it's worth the trip, ladies and gentlemen, and I really mean that, because he is a dear, dear friend of mine, sitting right over the chin, Mr. Milton Burrow. Yeah. Milton Burrow! Oh, he cried. Thank you, Dean. Thank you. Uh, well, I finally got on. <laughs> Did McGovern get elected yet? <laughs> Tonight, I feel like Zsa Zsa Gabor's next husband. I know what I'm supposed to do, but how do you make it interesting? Uh, I don't feel much like working anyway, because my wife ran away with my best friend, and I miss him. Everything has happened to me since I'm here at the hotel. Uh, uh, coming through, listen. No, this is the truth. Coming through the casino yesterday, a woman walked over me, this is the truth, Dean, with a little boy, and she said, C can I have an autograph for my little boy, Mr. Hope? <laughs> I said, my name's not Bob Hope. She said, what's the difference? The kid can't read anyway. This is how... <laughs> Danny, with all your money, I don't know why you would want to go back on TV, but I tell you the truth, Danny told me that that's, you said you to your life. Danny said to me, Milton, I'll die on the stage. And I've seen him do it many, many times. <laughs> You're all probably wondering why I don't have a new show. There's a good reason. <laughs> yeah, your old one. I would... <laughs> I must say, for a man who is on his way out, you look marvelous. <laughs> Not a wrinkle on his face. <laughs> There's no more room. <laughs> I can tell you that Danny, truthfully, is in very, very good health. A month ago, he complained of terrible headaches, but the doctor unscrewed his halo, and now he's fine. <laughs> this man that we are honoring tonight is a perfect physical specimen. Specimen. <laughs> I wish I could talk like you, Austin. I really could. That Austin, you're beautiful. You're beautiful. Produces, directs, sings, dances, does magic. How do you do all these things? Magnificently. I would. <laughs> I assure you, mine was better. This man we are honoring tonight was even asked to pose, to pose in the nude for one of the girly magazines. Imagine that. What is the world coming to, Dean? Would you take your clothes off for money, would you? Is that a question or a proposition? <laughs> what, do you, what do you think? The way I've seen you swing a purse, I'm not sure, baby. <laughs> Roddy. At least, at least I can still swing. It's always good. It's always good to see Lucille Ball uh, here at these functions. Her husband, Gary Morton, would, uh, would uh, like to retire, but since nobody knows what he does, he can't figure out what to retire from. <laughs> Lucy is a gang of woman to handle. Her first husband, of course, you know, was Desi Arnaz, the Cuban drummer, who married her and had a hit show and struck it rich. He went from bongo to bango to bingo. <laughs> This is a boy from the ghetto, Nipsey Russell. He's a terrific performer. You, you see him, uh, uh, he, he was the, the shark in Joys. Well, those were Nipsey's teeth. <laughs> I, was Nipsey, I know. I was kidding. Because, hey, you don't have to apologize, Milk. No, no, don't do that. I'm happy to be here. They have only the most distinguished two, Jimmy Walker and me. That's great. Oh, you mean the blacks? Right. We had a contest in the ghetto to see who would represent Harlem on Danny's roast, and we lost. <laughs> Oh, yes. Ruth Buzzy. 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 She sounds like a bee in heat. <laughs> Nobody's perfect. <laughs> and Ruth is less than others. Oh, by the way, Ruth just came in... She just came in second in a beauty contest. <laughs> Don Knotts was first. 
But Ruth has made peace with herself. She has accepted the fact that her legs don't match Ann Margaret's. <laughs> A purse doesn't bother me. <laughs> they don't match Ann Margaret. She'd be very happy if her legs matched each other. <laughs> Danny is doing so well. Just the other day, he got an offer to tear down his nose and put up a shopping center. <laughs> You are very fortunate in your domestic life, too. He has a lovely wife, a great companion, and a romantic companion. And if they ever found out about each other, they'll kick his brains out. <laughs> you're a good man. I mean, you're a good man, a kind man, a religious man. Do me a favor. Would you do this for me? The next time you talk to God, Ask him to get me on the Hollywood Square. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now it's time to introduce our man of the hour, yeah. a man who is highly respected in our profession. As far as I'm concerned, I have to respect a guy who can walk on water. I can't even walk on floors. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, our honored guest, Mr. Danny Thomas. Thank you very much, Dean, and thank you for the honor. I've been sitting here for a long time listening to your barbs and arrows. But a man many years ago once wrote, if you've not been criticized, booed, or jeered, or such, it's not because you have no flaws. It's because you don't count so much. I want to thank all of my beloved friends for making me count. Thank you for tonight. I love you. <laughs> 